Hello viewers, this is AK Wasp, and welcome to part 1 of my Fight Kiln Guide. In the first part, we will be discussing the equipment and inventory setup, and at the tail end of this video, we'll also be covering how to use my spreadsheet, which is an excellent supplementary information for when you're entering the cave. But before we get into that, we're first going to take a look at the gear, meaning what you want to wear what you want in your Beast of Burden, and what you want in your inventory. Now, this guide is split up into four, er, into six different parts, the first five of which all are meant as introductory to, interme to intermediate level uh, tutorial, meaning that I don't assume that you know anything about the fight kiln going into it, so I'll be telling you everything step by step. And I also don't assume that you have a cape to begin with. So I will be, you know, walking you through how to get your first cape. And then eventually we'll be going into part six, which is where you no longer need the Beast of Burden. Because you'll just be so proficient after learning all my tips that you will just be able to take on the fight cave without any Beast of Burden. And preferably with Steel Titan. So, anyways, let's just jump right into it then. Uh, in the fight kill, you will be subjected to 37 waves of monsters. Um, most of these waves have only one type of enemy, either mage, uh, melee, or rangers. But in many of the waves, there's a, a mixture. And as such, you definitely need to bring all three styles of combat into the fight kill. Um, when you get into the advanced tutorial in part 6, that'll actually change. You don't really need three sets of armor. But as far as your uh, beginning level stuff, we're going to consider that you do um, because it's just easier to have it and you have the extra space with the Beast of Burden anyways. So, what do, you, what do I consider to be armor? Well, I consider armor to be the the body, the legs, the and, and, and a shield. So let's just start with the shield because that's probably the you know quickest thing to say. Obviously if you have a divine or an elation shield, those are pretty good options. But even if you had them, and I don't assume you do since they're quite expensive, I'd still perhaps lean towards the dungeoneering shields. Not because they're free, but because of the offensive bonuses that they provide. So let's take a look at the two that I'm recommending, which are the Farseer Kite Shield and the Eagle-Eyed Kite Shield. The Farseer, Farseer Kite Shield is the, uh, is the Magic Shield, and the Eagle-Eyed is the Range Shield. The third one would be the Chaotic Shield, and I, I don't find that to be... Uh, useful enough to, to merit bringing with you into the fight kill. Now the Farseer Kite Shield has excellent magic offense, 17. So I mean you definitely want to be having that equipped when you are in the, uh, when whenever you're using magic. And it also has pretty good, you know, 55 to all your, your melee defenses and big 40 to your uh, what is this? To your range? Oh yeah, to range. Wow. And um, anyways, good absorption. It's just a very good shield all around uh, for any time when you're not using range. And it has zero uh, negative qualities or negative offensive statistics to your melee attack. So this is the shield you're going to want equipped when you are using either your magic attack or your melee attack. Now when you're using your range attack, you really don't want that minus 15. So I do recommend bringing along an Eagle Eye Kite Shield. Uh, an alternative would be if you went with a Xyrite Bow or something like that where you had a two-handed weapon instead of a one-handed weapon, then you might not just bring a ranged shield at all. But if you have both, I recommend bringing both. Uh, next topic, let's get into... Um, well, let's go into this bottom column down here. Or bottom row, I should say. So the gloves... Uh, I recommend taking the Goliath Gloves if you have them. Not that they're compulsory by any means. Um, what I like about the Goliath Gloves is they just have really high all-around offensive and defensive bonuses. 
Now the Dominion Tower rewards, you know, they have the Goliath gloves, which are technically melee orientated. Then they have the ones which are orientated towards magic and ranged, and they all, you know, give you bonuses if you use them in certain ways. But we're not, we're not going to be doing that at all. We are just strictly going to be using these Goliath gloves for their, um, what do you call it? Just their stats. Which means, if you can't use Goliath gloves, just throw on your best uh, pair of Recipe for Disaster gloves. If you have the uh, RFD gloves 10, that's perfectly adequate. Uh, and if you just don't do quests, then, you know, just get a rege regen bracelet. That'll work pretty well, too. Uh, especially if you wind up going with prayers over curses, which I'll discuss in a moment. Um, if you go with prayers, you have the option of doing a rapid renewal prayer, which, when combined with the regen bracelet, increases your hit points recovery by tenfold. So that's pretty good. Anyways, uh, so for the boots, I recommend Infinity Boots. There's really nothing else to say. You really want Infinity Boots. Uh, if you can't, you know, they're cheap. Uh, Rage Fire are, you know, a lot more expensive. Not that expensive, they're about, I think, 8 million right now. And they only give you plus one uh, in both uh, the uh, offensive and defensive to, to magic. Uh, the thing I like about the Infinity Boots is that you're using magic against the bosses because the bosses are weak to magic. So, you know, that's the most useful boots to have. And unlike Dragon Boots or, you know, range oriented Boots, there's no negative qualities associated with them. So... Uh, Infinity Boots is definitely the way to go. Now, as far as your ring goes, I recommend using the ring that came with the quest. Uh, if you haven't, if you're not aware of it at, by this point, uh, you have to complete the Elder Kill quest before you can fight in the Fight Kill minigame. And this is a reward from the quest, so anybody who's going into the Fight Kill should definitely have access to this ring. If you have charges left on it, it'll do 10% additional damage. And if not, you know, it still has plus four to all stats, which is just really powerful. You know, it's the same as an imbued diamond ring, and it's just two uh, stats lower on everything compared to an uh, imbued onyx ring. Um, so I recommend using that. If you are just low on Tuckle and you can't afford to recharge it, I believe it still retains the plus four stats. I'd still recommend using it unless you do have, you know, access to an Alex and Butte ring. Then you could, you know, either bring a, a swap or just wear, or just wear that instead. But the ten percent damage is nice. And you're definitely going to want to swap it on when you're killing the Jads and when you're killing uh, Har Ak Aiken. I believe is how you might pronounce it. So, um, as far as your uh, cape, if you have completed the fight kill before. Wear the new cape. It's really good. It has excellent defensive stats. You know, it's got a little bit of offensive stats in every, uh, you know, balanced area of the triangle. Uh, you know, it's definitely the best melee cape in the game. Not necessarily the best r magic or range, but it has excellent defenses. Uh, and it's got, you know, two prayers, so it's got some prayer on it, too. Uh, you know, if you don't have it, wear a fire cape. Fire capes are pretty good, too. Uh, you know, pretty much the same thing. Um, and we're going to be using broad bolts as the ranged um, ammunition as opposed to diamond bolts. They have the exact same range strength bonus. Diamond bolts just have the ability to hit their special attack, but they're a bit more expensive and people tend not to like to just leave them on the ground. So if you're going to bring diamond bolts, you're going to want to bring an Avos Alerter and it's just going to take another inventory spot and it's just really not worth it. Um, you're better off just forfeiting the special uh, ability of the diamond bolts in favor of, you know, just being able to leave these bolts on the ground. Uh, you see I got 1510 left. That means that I used, what, 490 the last time I went through the cave. So, you know, you don't lose that much. They, they're cheap, um, and they're actually a pretty good fletching experience if you're making them yourself for, you know, to level your fletching. And the final item that doesn't vary is the helm. Uh, and for the helm, we're using the full Slayer helm because the full Slayer helm has plus three magic and plus three ranged offensive uh, bonuses. You know, anything else you go with is going to have, like the Gandermic Visor will have plus seven magic, but will have negative to your range. Or uh, maybe an Armadillo uh, helmet would have vice versa. So 
And if you went with the Virak helmet, you'd get better all-around defenses, and you'd get a prayer bonus, but then you'd have, you know, negative offenses. As opposed to the Slayer full helmet, you get pretty, you know, pretty good, a little bit of everything, and eventually when you do s switch over to uh, using the Steel Titan, you know, you can stick, It's char it can be charged. Um, I believe his name is Pickup Sticks, or Pickup Mix, the, uh, the summoner from Taverly. He'll charge it for you, and then you can stick the scrolls right into it, and it lets your Titan cast the, you know, the Steel of Legends scroll free of charge. Uh, it still costs a scroll, but it doesn't cost any special uh, attack bar. And then for the Amulet, the Amulet of Fury is a awesome I option. If you have the Arcane Stream Necklace, I recommend bringing it along also because, you know, it actually does, you will notice the benefit from it to switch it on when you're using your magical attacks, but if you don't have it, it's not a big deal. Um, and if if you weren't, you know, if you didn't have this much extra inventory space because of the Beast of Burden, I wouldn't recommend bringing it. But it is, it is more, it is beneficial to have it. So bring both, wear your fury most of the time, throw on your arcane stream necklace when you're maging. Um, only thing, don't accidentally forget to take it off when you're not maging. I, I've done that uh, several times. So, you know, it doesn't give you any, you know, unlike the fury, oops, unlock compare. Unlike the Fury, you know, it doesn't give you any stats and anything except for your magical offense. So, if you're going to be ranging or meleeing, you want to put the Fury back on. So, don't forget to take it off if you do decide to bring the Arcane Stream. Now, so I talked a bit about most of the, you know, the non-changing items. Uh, your Aura, obviously bring the best combat Aura you have available. Um, for me... That would be greater reverence, possibly penance, but I find that, you know, penance helps more if you're getting hit a lot. So perhaps if you're really new to this, penance might be better. But in general, reverence would be the uh, way that I would recommend. Vampirism would be another option. And then Aegis, if anybody, you know, has that. The thing with Aegis, though, is it only lasts a half hour, and it doesn't really do all that much. So the only reason you bring Aegis is, you know, to throw it on for, like, the last few waves. So something with, like, Reverence lasts for a full hour and is overall a better choice in my opinion. So I think that covers most of that stuff. So now let's actually get into the melee gear. So the melee gear is straight up just a Chaotic Rapier. You know, if you are in the classic Rapier versus Chaotic Longsword debate, if you really want to bring a longsword, no one's going to stop you. <laughs> I'm not going to stop you. Just bring a longsword if you want it. But I'm telling you, a rapier is more insufficient to just completely tear through the rangers. Um, in fact, there's certain places where I just wind up ranging the rangers, which, you know, is obviously less efficient than meleeing them. And, you know, they don't have that high defense. The only reason you'd really want a chaotic longsword is if you're meleeing something that has a high defense. And you're not meleeing anything that has high defense unless you decide to melee Jad, which is just not outside of the scope of this guide. I don't recommend it. It's an option, but I don't recommend it. I find that Storm of Armadil works much better because, you know, Jad is weak to, or weakest to mage, or to magic, magical attacks out of the combat triangle. Um, and then obviously, as you can see, this whole time I've had the Bandos chest plate and tacits on um, if you can't afford them, you know, maybe throw on Varix Tassis or something, but th this works well, and it gives you a uh, good, you know, real good defenses, especially in your range, then your melee, uh, and you actually have, I wouldn't say decent magic, but you wouldn't be using this unless you're not getting hit by magic, meaning praying magic, or there's nothing attacking you with magic. So, because, you know, in the combat triangle, melee takes on range. So, anyways, this is your melee setup. Now we're going to take a look real quick at your uh, range setup. So it's basically a four-item switch. I recommend bringing the armadillo chest plate and chain skirt because they're just awesome and they give you excellent 
uh, range attack bonus, and then also your Chaotic Crossbow and your Eagle Eye Kite Shield. As I mentioned before, the Zerite Bow is a good option uh, in contrast to the Chaotic Crossbow. Um, one of the issues that I would have with the Zerite Bow is that you might actually, you know, and when you equip it, it only takes, or it's a two-handed weapon, so you're unequipping two items. So you might wind up in a situation where you have to keep, you know, dropping a potion onto the floor and picking it up because you just don't have the inventory space. And personally, I find that annoying, and I find nothing wrong with the Chaotic Crossbow. You know, it has a 120 ranged attack bonus, which is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and if you if you don't have a Chaotic Crossbow, uh, a Rune Crossbow would suffice. This isn't like Nex, where every little bit of ranged attack counts. I mean, everything helps. But, you know, 90, you know, 30 less range attack isn't going to, you know, ruin anything. Um, and yeah, just don't forget, so see right here we're at 209 range attack, whereas with the uh, Farseer Kite Shield equipped instead, we're at uh, 190. So it's not a huge deal, but, you know, don't have the wrong shield on, preferably. Uh, so yeah, that's your... Um, what's it called, your ranged setup, and for magical setup, you have, or I recommend having the Ganodermic Poncho and Leggings, because they have excellent um, stats for, actually let me get this cat grape here off, so, and, and a polypore staff, because they have excellent stats regarding defense, you know, absolutely insane magical defense, absolutely insane um, melee defense, and importantly, absolutely insane magical attack, which is just great. Um, and I recommend bringing the Polypore Staff as a cheap option for, you know, knocking out the majority of all the melee creatures in the fight kiln because it's a lot cheaper than Storm of Armadillo. That said, I still recommend bringing Storm of Armadillo for the bosses. So grab a Armadillo Battle Staff alongside your other gear and make sure you have enough Armadillo runes. Um, I believe something in the, on the magnitude of, you know, 100 runes would be uh, enough for the fight kill, but, you know, grab 200 to be safe. I just grab, you know, a stack and whatever, as long as you're over 200, you have absolutely nothing to, you know, even think about. It's not even in the back of my mind. Um, yeah, so that is your melee setup, or your magic setup, and if you have the arcane stream, throw that on as well. Make sure you remember to take it off when you're uh, not using it. Um, in addition, when you're using this method, meaning the Beast of Burden method, as opposed to having a combat familiar alongside you, you need to have some sort of a pickaxe. And unfortunately the bronze pickaxe, which we now can keep in our tool belts, won't cut it. You need to have either, well preferably a, a dragon pickaxe or a rune pickaxe or uh, an Infernal Adze. I just have that, you know, readily available in the bank, so I grab it. And it works excellent. It's, it has the same, you know, characteristics as a Rune Pickaxe. So technically, if you have a Dragon Pickaxe, go ahead and grab that instead. The reason you need a Pickaxe is against the, um, I forget their actual name, but I, I call them the Armadillos, because they have this, they look like Armadillos, they have the similar posture to Armadillos, and they have a thick shell um, like armor on their you know carcass which you have to break through with the pickaxe before you can deal damage to them. There are two exceptions to that rule and that would be dreadnips hit right through them and so do combat familiars but when you're using a pakiak or a tortoise you don't have that available to you and, letting, and the dreadnip just takes too long to kill it on its own so you're really going to need to have a pickaxe to break through their shell. Um, and then finally your special weapon, the Enhanced Excalibur, if you have that from the, I believe it's the Elite Sears Diary, is in my opinion the hands down no-brainer no option here. Um, if you don't have the Enhanced Excalibur, I would still recommend bringing a normal Excalibur. And then if you don't have that, I suppose, I don't know, I guess I suppose uh, Ceridoman, God Sword, or Dragon Claws, but you know, they're not really as good as something which is going to heal you like the Enhanced Excalibur will because the Enhanced Excalibur effectively you know, heals 400 and overloads uh, damage you 500 so they 
pretty much, well not exactly, but more or less kind of counter each other out. So it's, it's nice and quite helpful. So that covers all of the actual gear, which is, has been quite a, a mouthful to say the least. Um, and we can move on to additional items in the inventory. Um, as you've noticed right up here, I have dread nips. You know, I have a thousand, but you're not going to, you're not even going to use a hundred. So if you know, I believe it's, you know, every five boss kills, once you've unlocked them, gives you a hundred dread nips. So they're, they're free of cost, essentially. Their, their cost is in time. Um, so there's opportunity cost, I guess you would call it. But essentially they're free and they're very powerful, very strong, hit re real well. Um, if you're, you know, if you're struggling, if you've struggled in the past against Jad in the fight caves, yeah, you probably wouldn't want to use them against Jad because it, uh, it, it takes, you know, a few extra clicks, which might be enough to get you KO'd. So might not be a good idea. But against the, uh, what I call the magic cats, basically the big, you know, the, the large majors, which are uh, reminiscent from the fight caves. Uh, in the fight caves, they were level 360. I think they're 400 or something in, in the fight kiln. Um, yeah, the dreadnips really speed up the kill um, because unlike in the fight caves where when you use the protection prayer, prayer or a deflection curse, you didn't take any damage from that you know area of the combat triangle. In the fight kiln, you will take, um, I guess... Uh, for lack of a better term, I would call it splash damage, um, where, you know, it, it reduces the majority of the damage, but you're still taking, you know, these constant hits of, like, 8 to 15 every time that you are normally getting hit. So the the faster you can drop a monster that's doing that kind of damage, especially the magical cats, the better for you. So the dreadnips help a lot there, more than anywhere else. Um, and then, obviously, against Hara can too, but that's, you know, a relatively small consideration compared to, you know, how slow the the magical cats are to kill. Um, I so obviously you want to summon up a your beast of burden outside in the banking area. This is by the way just outside the fight kiln. Um, you should be familiar with it because you've been here when you've done the quest. If you haven't done the quest, you have to do the quest before you can do the mini game. So you should know where this is. You can t use the uh, the ring to teleport directly here. No, that didn't actually take me anywhere. It took me one step backwards. So, um, yeah, where was I going with that? So yeah, you have your Pakiak or whatever your Beast of Burden may be, preferably a Pakiak, and also bring a secondary pouch because if this is your first time doing it or even if you haven't done it a bunch of times, you will probably run out of timer on your familiar before you finish because, you know, real good players can do it in significantly less than an hour, but it still takes quite a bit of time and familiars tend to last under an hour. So having a secondary pouch is a excellent idea and I always recommend as, as a good rule of thumb to have your secondary pouch in your inventory and not in your familiar because there's nothing worse than, you know, having 10, or the, I'm sure there's plenty of things worse, but it's very annoying to have 10 potions in your yak, and so is your pouch, and you're in the middle of combat, and you can't get to a peaceful, you know, safe spot so that you can get the pouch out of there, and then all your potions drop on the floor, and it's just frustrating and, you know, distracting and can can get you killed in a, in a, in a, ugly situation. So just have that extra pouch in your inventory and then go ahead and right click renew when the when the timer comes up. And and I feel that's a good rule of thumb for all your pouches. So, you know, a lot of people like to have their healing familiar in their pack yak so they, you know, they know that when they've taken it out, there's nothing in their pack yak because that's the last item in their pack yak. You know, it's not that hard to just check your pack yak manually and see how many spaces are left. So I don't really recommend keeping the healing familiar in your pack yak. I recommend keeping it on your inventory so that when you need it, you can easily get to it. Um, that's a pretty long rant about familiar, you know, organization. But I feel it's important and it'll help you. Um, and, you know, 
if if you find that you know this little rant was actually helpful uh, and saved your life after you use my guide, go ahead and leave a comment, and I will know that it was worth it. So, anyways, I recommend bringing three overload flasks. All your potions that you're going to be bringing are going to be flasks because you know you could do it with vials, but there's no reason not to bring flasks. They're not that much more expensive, and they do offer you 50% more potions you know, per trip, because you can take six doses, six doses per inventory slot, as opposed to four doses. So there's no reason not to bring six dose potions, um, which are called flasks. And essentially, you know, every dose of overload lasts five minutes, so does every dose of prayer renewal. So each flask is a half hour. Three of each flask will last you an hour and a half, which is, quite frankly, more than it should take you. But if it is your first attempt, or one of your first attempts, or if you've been struggling, uh, especially when you're in the Beast of Burden method, you know, it actually would be the time when I would recommend throwing a fourth overload and per renewal into your Beast of Burden, just in case you need them. Um, hopefully, you shouldn't have to, you know, even use half the potions which are in your Beast of Burden. But they're there just in case you need them, and if 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 you have used them all up, that's why you're also bringing along a healing familiar, preferably a unicorn. You know, if you're not using a pack yak and you're using a tortoise, and if you don't have a unicorn, I guess you'd be bringing a bunyip. But you know, in an ideal situation, you'll have a pack yak and a unicorn, and quite frankly, you should never even need that unicorn. But it's there. You should never need half of the potions in your uh, that you're bringing with you either. But they're there to support you just in case you need them. Um, so yeah, as you can see, I have the f three prayer renewals in the inventory, three overloads, one Ceridome and Brew, and one Super Restore, um, which is your means of rest oh, the Ceridome and Brew is your primary means of healing and your super restore is your primary means of recovering your prayer. Well, I say primary, but it's the only means of uh, recovering your prayer. So that is very useful, and you know, generally, this is 2-1, and then 3-1, 3-1, 3-1. So you got your 3-to-1 ratio, uh, more or less, of Cerdome and Brews to super restores, which is, you know, a, a, a relatively reasonable rule of thumb to follow. Um, and then, yeah, so just line them up, you know, obviously don't have like 20 Ceridome and Brews in a row and then five Super Restores at the end, because that's just going to make it more difficult for you when it's time for you to, you know, right click and take your Beast of Burden. Or, you know, if you've set your left click option to take Beast of Burden, that's actually not a bad idea either. Um, especially if you're using the Beast of Burn method because it makes it, you know, faster and a little bit less clicking intensive. But if, you know, if you're like me and you're used to having the special attack be the clicking option and then just right clicking for take Beast of Burn, then, you know, it might be more distracting to change from your normal routine. And that covers most of the equipment setup. You'll, you'll notice that I have these, uh, Four rock tails. Well, before I mention about the rock tails, um, when you're ready to finally go in, take a sip of overload, heal up, and then go in, because then you know you won't have to. You'll be at full health upon entering. You'll be at full boosted stats upon entering, and you know five minutes after having entered, you'll gain a free 500 health just because that's when your overload will have run off and you gain the health back. So that's a nice little tidbit. Now, there's these four rock tails here, which might as well just be four empty spots. The reason that I am saying that I throw these rock tails in is because they're easy to eat and they, you know, they're very just convenient. And um, the other option would be to bring uh, up to four potions that have, you know, aren't full, to, aren't filled to capacity, because all right, so the whole reason is because you're picking up crystals. Within the fight kiln, I should I should mention this because I'm not assuming that you know anything beforehand. Within the fight kiln, every two rounds, a power-up crystal spawns in the 
center of the uh, room, essentially, and when and they're cyclical and you know predictable. And w if you reference my table spreadsheet, whatever you want to call it, um, I list you know exactly when each one is coming up, and the order is basically invulnerability, restoration, magic, range, strength, constitution. And it cycles that way three times. So, yeah, three times. Right? Yeah, definitely three times. Okay. So, and the only one that's not worth picking up at all is, range, or is um, strength, in my opinion. And really, the range one's not that useful either, but I usually grab it um, the first time around to use in the, you know, in the second quarter of the battle, which is all against mages because it helps a lot. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. That'll all be covered in part three, I believe. Yeah, part three waves, you know, 11 through 20. Um, but what you need to know at this point is that, you know, within the first 12 minutes of the battle, you'll be picking up four uh, crystals. So you're going to want to have four available inventory spots. So either, you know, don't bring anything in four spots or bring stuff that you plan to use up right away, or bring stuff that you don't mind dropping, because you'll want to hold them onto them, and they stack, and you're going to pretty much have three of each throughout the um, entirety of the cave, so you want to have spots for them. Um, and I'm not sure if they actually go in the pack yak, but there, there's no reason why you'd ever want to put them in the pack yak, because they're you know they're very they they you know they're only useful if you use them in your inventory and they stack so you really wouldn't want to put them in the pack yak, and I think that has covered everything that I had to say about the inventory and equipment setup, so now I'm going to discuss a little bit about the uh, spreadsheet which I recommend pulling up if you have a if you have a two monitor setup like I do and I uh, I guess most people probably do, then it's really useful to have it. Otherwise, you could, you know, literally just print it out and have a, a sheet of paper, which is real quick reference. Um, and it, it really helps guiding you along because it's color-coded and it tells you exactly which monsters are coming up. And I have it dumbed out, or not dumbed down, but I have it, you know, in game language, which is, you know, Ket Dill, Ket Zek, Ket Zill, all these crazy names. And I also have in like normal people colloquial language, which, you know, Armadillo, Magic Cat, you know, Little Magic, Little Mage, Little Ranger, you know, those little guys too. So it, it, it's a little, a little bit easier to uh, to know exactly what's coming up when. Um, and without further ado, I'm just going to jump right into that. So actually, I just wanted to really quickly, um, I remember that I actually did capture the footage from when I was doing the fight cave on my first attempt, and I think it kind of looks cool, so I figured I'll include it into this segment, where, um, so the first time, the, if this is your very first time attempting the fight kiln, you have to bring a, you know, a fire cape to sacrifice, so, um, using one of those, you know, four empty spots that I recommend, or four rock tail spots, wh whatever you might want to call them. Um, yeah, just bring a fire cape, and you give it to this purple dude, and he will just shred it into pieces, just like that. Yep. So, I don't know, that's pretty cool. And now let's talk about the spreadsheet. Hey, so uh, on screen now you should be seeing a uh, close-up of my spreadsheet. And it's available. I posted it on uh, Google Documents, so there will be a link in the description so that you can download it yourself. And then either just throw it up on a second monitor so you can follow along while you're doing your fight kill, or print it out, or you know pull it up on an Android device. Whatever. It's a uh, pretty self-explanatory, so I'm not going to dwell on it too much. But in a nutshell, uh, you have your top row, which has all the in-game names of the creatures that spawn and then you know they're plotted or not plotted but you know then you have your 37 waves and wherever you know they intersect there is you know one so that means on wave one you can expect one ranger and two little rangers and two uh, baby hers and uh, you know on wave 20 you can expect one jad one magic cat 
and that's it. And so basically that's how it's laid out. And you know, it's uh, the spreadsheet is you know open for anybody. You can't edit it on the Google Documents, but you can just copy paste it right into your own spreadsheet program, be it Excel or um, LibreOffice or OpenOffice or I don't know whatever it is the Max use for Office. Um, you know, you can just edit it to your own liking, but it's got all the information in it uh, basically. And then, so, like I said, the top row has all the in-game names of the creatures. And then, right below it, I put in my own little nicknames for them. Because that's just how I think of them. So, you know, when I see Cat Zek, I'm like, what is a Cat Zek? Is that like... Because it's Cat, so it's confusing with regular Cat, which is a little melee guy. As opposed to Cat Zek is actually a magical cat. So, I just think of it as a magical cat and go for from there and then I'm, I'm it it helps me to you know kind of understand what's coming up next if you find distracting then just you know remove it whatever um, and then also the crystals so as you notice they're cyclical they go from invulnerability to constitution and they do so uh, three times repeating and so I recommend it just happens to be four and then nothing and then four and then two nothing and then four and then two nothing but it's not always like that so it's Everything between Constitution and Magic, I recommend picking up. And then the very first range crystal, because it's beneficial to use it, you know, between waves 11 and 20, which are highly populated in uh, terms of magical opponents. So they're effective to range against. And so anyways, just walking how the spreadsheet works. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, there's a link to the YouTube playlist so that this guy automatically plays. Um, and then, you know, there's notes, so I basically say, hey, on these waves you protect range. And I'm like, hey, on this wave, Jad spawns in the southwest corner. And then, hey, on this right, on this wave, you know, you want to pray against melee, and then you want to blitz the ranger in the northwest corner first. And then, you know, then you do whatever next is obvious. So, it's little notes, these are notes, you can change notes, add to them, you know, make them shorter, whatever you may like to do. Um, they're not particularly long, but they, they work well for me. Um, you know, edit them however you want. And the crystals, it's very, you know, easy, I would say, to forget to pick up the crystals when they're spawning because there's so much going on in the cave that especially your first time around, you know, it's you get distracted and you just don't remember to go pick up the crystals. So and then having them all the way down at this end doesn't really help because they, they spawn at the end of the wave. So they spawn at the end of wave one, or at the beginning of wave two. So I color coded them, obviously yellow for the ones that I recommend picking up, and then you know blue is basically after they've spawned at wave one. You know you're picking them up at the beginning of wave two. So it's this extra little reminder. And then you might notice that 25, 26, and 36 or 35 are just bold or not bold but red, and that's just because I find that those are the more challenging waves because of the mechanics involved which I'll get into in their respective sub guides so I hope you find this useful go ahead and uh, edit it as much as you want and yeah I hope you find it useful and just you know print it out and keep it alongside as supplementary material when taking on the fight kill challenge and please you know continue on with this playlist and or click the next link and then go on to my part two yes part part two of the fight kiln guide which is the first ten waves alright thank you